you sometimes you hear young kids say they're the first Vietnamese generation. That may be true. Or some other kids might say they're the second generation. That's also true. There's no defi definite term. And um, first, first generation is usually, for the purpose of this presentation, the first generation is usually the parents, the adults, coming over to the United States. Uh, the second generation is the kids being born in the United States. But there's also people who were born in Vietnam who came to the U.S. as a child. Um, they're the, uh, the 1.5 generation. So they have an extra decimal there. No, uh, can you go back? Okay, thanks. The, the, the most distinctive characteristic about the Vietnamese community is that 72% of us are f uh, of the of Vietnamese Americans adult are foreign born. But they're also naturalized. Compared to other Asian groups, um, Filipino, Chinese, Korean, Indian, Japanese, we have the most naturalized citizens. So mm -hmm. we, we're the one who has uh, the green cards, the uh, being a citizens. Um, even though we're, we're still a relatively younger group compared to the Chinese or the Korean or the Japanese who have been here the longest. Now, the question of how we're doing um, as, as, a, as a group is really interesting. In the household income, it's, it's, it's always been the general that Asian Americans make slightly higher than the average American when it comes to medium household incomes. Uh, but for Vietnamese, even though we're not um, at the top as the Indian or the, the Filipinos or Japanese Chinese, we have an average median income of $53,000, and it's higher than the average U.S. income of 49000 That's something, looking at the numbers, looking at statistics, it really does say something how we made it as a group in America. And when we, when we look at the poverty level, it's no different. Um, the numbers for Vietnamese, it's slightly higher than the Chinese and the Japanese, the big major groups. Uh, at 15%, but if you look at the U.S. population, it's 13%, so we're just slightly above that. And since we've been here about 30 to 40 years, in, in the overall sense, we're not doing too bad. Yes, these are the people who identify themselves as Vietnamese. Yeah, Vi as Vietnamese. Um, the, this, this survey was done by the Poor Research Center. And usually, uh, when, we, when they study pan uh, Asian groups, Asian Americans, they never look at my, um, Vietnamese as a big group. But since the numbers are rising, they have broken down not just Vietnamese, but other groups as well. And they, they use surveys to, uh, to get this information. Okay, and when we look at the employment status of Vietnamese, what kind of jobs do they have? Now, the numbers are really hard to see, uh, so I'll, I'll point them out. Now, the type of jobs that they have, 67% um, were in the repair, maintenance, personal, um, and laundry services and retail trade. Um, so a great majority are local ownerships. And um, as far as the number of firms, um, there are about 230,000 firms and it has been growing 15% uh, in the last decade. And according to this research, it has generated about $28.8 billion. Uh, that's something to say that uh, Vietnamese are very entrepreneur. Uh, do you guys know Charlie Tom? Tom, um, he's the he's the owner of Rego Nails. It's the largest franchise for Vietnamese. The Rego Nails. Uh, he's he's one of the more successful, uh, prominent story of how he's how he created the franchise. Now he spread that around the United States. Um, <laughs> a small percentage of other Vietnamese have also have uh, are in the um, the shrimping business in Louisiana. So they, they, they remain about 
five to ten percent. But most of these jobs are in the, as, as I would say, the traditional middle class jobs, uh, not in the Fortune 500 companies yet. I think we have a long way to go before we reach that. But as far as starting their own business and um, uh, making a success around, making a success out of it, I think a lot of Vietnamese are doing quite well. Um, the nail business in particular is one of the dominant uh, business. Uh, I, my, par my, uh, my parents do nails. So I, I, the statistics means uh, kind of relevant to me. Um, I, I remember, uh, how did Vietnamese get into the business of nails? Why did it become so popular? It was actually this actress named Tiki Pedro. She, she was a very famous actress back in the 60s where she worked with Alfred Hitchcock for all the movies. Uh, but she was also an uh, international coordinator and she would be helping all the Vietnamese resettle into the United States. And she had manicures herself. And uh, seeing that as a trade, she actually arranged for the manicures to teach a couple of Vietnamese how to do nails. And eventually that kind of spread out that's that's what the uh, the legends say, so so that's really interesting. Can you change the next slide? Now, what are the challenges um, do these small communities face? For one thing, um, according to this, based on surveys done in Texas and California, uh, the predominant uh, challenges that Vietnamese identified are long hours, uh, too little time with family having worked uh, so much, the limited resources, not knowing where to get things, not knowing um, uh, uh, where the resource, resources are, too much responsibility, uh, the presence of regulatory agencies, that's a really interesting one, I think. I, I think uh, having moved from Vietnam to the United States where the rule of law is abundant, it's something a lot of Vietnamese have to struggle, learning the laws of the system and learning how to work uh, within parameters, and customer relations. A lot, of the, a lot of these businesses are in retail, so customers' relation plays a really big part, <coughs> and it's also a challenge for Vietnamese. Now, there are some uh, trends. Poli um, Vietnamese have been active in politics. We all know Joseph Gao. He's very famous. He's a very famous congressman from Louisiana. Um, he didn't survive re-election. Um, uh, Chui Ta, he's the new mayor of Westminster, a really big city for Vietnamese, and Julie Nguyen, a circuit court judge. And we can also see Vietnamese Americans becoming active in issues in human rights. I, I remember a year ago where there was a huge human rights campaign um, called by a lot of uh, community members around the city trying to encourage people to sign a petition and then getting uh, certain representatives to meet with State Department representatives um, to outline the issue. Uh, human rights activism is a big part, um, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's I, I think it's mostly for adults. I'm not sure about the younger generation being active in that. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot. I, I wonder about the salience about that. Yeah, and, and they, they have the, the uh, you know, first hand connection with them. Yeah, so, you know, you, you can't lose that behind. You know, you lost, you know, lost your country, so they are very involved in that, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, that's just the way it's going to go. I agree. And for the older generation to communicate that with the se second generation, I think that's that's something to, uh, to work with, to struggle with. Now, as far as education goes, When we look at Pan-Asian Americans, Pan-Asian Americans, the statistics has always shown that Asian Americans do a lot better than the average US citizen as far as having a degree, an undergraduate degree. But when we break it down to uh, different groups, the Asian groups, we're still at the <coughs> bottom of having a, having a degree. And if, if we're 
comparing the types of degree, 19% of Vietnamese who have a degree are bachelors. Uh, a small number has an advanced degree, master's or PhD. And if you look at the Asian Americans, it's slightly lower. So, so hopefully after this presentation, uh, we can get the word out to get more people in the graduate school. <laughs> but we, we'll save that uh, a little bit later. Now, education is not easy for Vietnamese Americans. There's an education gap between Vietnamese Americans and for long established uh, Asian groups like the Chinese or Koreans here. Um, mostly, it's probably, it's mostly it's due to us being a new group. Mostly it's because parents don't know the language. Uh, I think 71% of adults don't have um, a strong proficiency in English uh, compared to, um, to, the other, to the other Asian groups. Um, and so you have these struggles of um, second generation um, trying to balance between the personal freedoms of these countries and the kind of restrictions that parents kind of impose sometimes. I, if you look down at the list, I think s some of them may be familiar to some of you. Or if not, then uh, you might be an outlier. Now, that, that's uh, what we're going to cover in the first session about the trends of Vietnamese Americans. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. If not, we can continue on with getting to uh, our topic of graduate school. Okay, first of all, I want to emphasize that graduate, going to graduate school is only a tool in a box. It's not a, a, a cure-all for everything. There's, lot, there's a lot of different reasons why people go to graduate school, and you don't necessarily have to have a graduate degree to be successful. If you know the stories of our parents, they are successful in their own rights and establish their own business and making um, uh, success for themselves and their kids. But this is for people who want to expand their scope in their career. Um, sometimes you want to get into a job and, it, and it's very specialized and it, and it requires some kind, sort of masters. And that's why some people want to get a graduate school, an MBA, law school, uh, medical school, um, teacher school. Um, the second reason is expanding your intellectual horizons, getting more research, learning about something more, enjoying the love of learning, um, being informed in your field of topic. Uh, sometimes that help with uh, enhancing your salary. A lot, of, a lot of jobs do have higher salary for higher degrees. <coughs> and also, if you think about going to graduate school, you want to think about the type of graduate school that you're going to. Uh, maybe a uh, graduate school that's known in particular for its field, um, just because you, you're surrounded by a lot of people with similar interests as you, and you can build your own network of people, uh, of, of people who can support you professionally. <coughs> now, unlike graduate school, unlike undergraduate school, you're going to have to ask yourself if graduate school is for you, because it's very, very different from an undergraduate. It's very demanding academically and personally. Sometimes um, you're gonna have to do more research than you expect. You're gonna have to work with different people in different life stages. Um, what I mean by that is in graduate school, sometimes there are people who come directly out of undergraduate, as well as people who are working at the same time and you know, taking classes so that they can finish their graduate school. There's a certain of maturity and professionalism that's expected of you. If the professor has signed a, uh, a book that you're supposed to read or coursework that you have to do, you want to make sure that you do it. And there's going to be a lot of research, there's going to be a lot of writing, and there's a lot of, pre uh, a lot of presenting that you have to do, and it involves a lot of time. Some people that I know go to graduate school and work at the same time. And it's always a struggle of balancing out um, their studies and the personal life, trying to uh, set the boundaries for that. When you, when you think about applying to graduate school, you want to look at the admission criteria. How do you see yourself 
competitively, competitively with everybody else. Now, I want you to imagine this. When you're applying to graduate school, if you're thinking about that, I want you to be the person who wears a I'm unique t-shirt. I know it looks stupid. I know it looks silly. I know um, it's, it's, it's kind of the mentality is weird for somebody to say, I'm unique, when everybody else says that I'm, they're unique as well. But you want to get noticed, because the admission people will look at the people who are unique. Okay? We're not going to get too much into financial support. That's, that's another topic. But there are scholarships and fellowships and assistantships available. Um, you want to look at the demographics and the culture. Um, how many students are, uh, are in the classroom? What kind of professors are teaching? There's a difference between graduate degrees, where you can get a master's and then eventually get a PhD. And there are professional degrees, like um, degrees like in JD or MD, where you use your knowledge and you apply. Now, every program is different. Uh, every school is different. All admissions criteria are different. It really depends on how you frame your narrative. Uh, the poten potential for employment. Some schools are better at employing other people uh, just because of their reputation and their rank. That's something you might want to look into. Uh, just because um, well, there's, there's this assumption that higher ranked schools and schools with good reputation already sorted out the, the best candidates. And you want to look the research of the faculty. If the, the research that the professors do is in alignment with something you're interested in studying. So when you look at all these factors when you're looking to a graduate school. Now, for the admissions community, sure, they'll look at the GRE, your test scores. They'll look at your experience. They'll, they'll look at your work experience. All of that is a complete package. Um, can we skip to the next slide? But the biggest thing that sets you apart from everybody else is your statement of purpose and your letters of recommendation. Your statement of purpose is who you are compared to everybody else. You don't have to assume that when you apply into this graduate school, everybody else is going to meet the admission standards, like the GPA, their test scores. That's already been, that's, 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 that's very common. What, what you're going to look at is, um, coming up with strategies to design your statement of purpose. How many of you have ever written about, um, if you're applying for a college or applying for scholarship, that you're you know, sons or daughters of immigrants? Use that narrative. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a really good story. And that's a really good story. And, and admission committees look at that. When I, work, when I was working at George Washington University, oh, um, we look at applications of candidates, and a lot of uh, a lot of like minorities would use their backstories. Now, how you use that backstories, you know, is will set you far, will set you apart. Um, if if you're talking about a narrative where, um, sure, you're a son of an uh, immigrant and your parents work hard, and you want to be successful, that's that's a pretty you know it's a good story, but it's a common story. But if you're, but that, that's more of a story how your parents are successful. Now you look at a story of how you use that, like um, you help in the shops, for example, or you, you work with your parents, or maybe that your parents believe in a certain, li certain lifestyle and, and life choices that, they, that you have to make to be successful. And sometimes they have to, they maybe contradict with yours. You wanna have um, a narrative um, that shows um, a sense of maturity from you, um, a personal reflection, as well as uh, some experience that you have done. I always find um, the, the successful candidates have a combination of work experience <coughs> and how they learn from that experience. Um, your letter of recommendation. Um, if you have good relationship with your professor, that's great. You can ask them for letters of re recommendation. If you don't, there's some strategies you could use. For example, you could, you could uh, ask a certain professor to write certain things about you. Um, the way I did it is that this professor knows me from this part of the program, and I asked, hey professor, can you please comment about my research abilities, my writing abilities, 
can, can you focus on that? Well, I go to another professor and I ask him, can you write me uh, a, um, a recommendation about uh, the stuff that I've been involved with in the school or for my work? So you're creating different narratives from different professionals. Um, some students um, write the letter of recommendations and they submit it to the professor and have them proofread it and sign. And I, and I would say anything's for a game. A lot of people do that. But a lot of universities are well aware of that as well. So they sent emails to professors so, so that they can, in addition to submitting their letter of recommendation, they also ask them to fill out like a, um, a survey about you, your leadership qualities or your, your uh, studentness in class. So, so be, be mindful of that when you're, you're thinking about recommendation. Um, so I know a lot of people, they go out of campus all the time, and I know that a lot of um, letters of recommendations, you have to fill in your professor's email, and they'll mail it, and you, they'll submit it. Um, so what advice do you have for people who haven't been in school in a while, haven't touched base with a professor? What would be the best way to kind of go back into that and kind of have them on your side to help you get into whatever program you That's have. a really great question. What happens if you're out of school for a while? And you're going to have to compensate that with experience. You're going to have to be involved with different organizations, um, uh, show that you're active um, in your work. Uh, maybe it, you're out of school for such a long time because you have to work. And no doubt that you can um, write about your work experience or personal narrative. Um, uh, when, when I when I sent my letters of recommendations to my, um, to law schools, I didn't include just professor. I also included my supervisors. I also asked my supervisors to write me letters of recommendation, and that that's 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 something you should be mindful of. It doesn't have to be just professors, and it depends on where what you want to do um, in graduate school. If you want to be a research person and you want to get a PhD, then you should get all professors attesting to your graduate skills, uh, attesting to your research skills, because a lot of professors, they, they, they're recruiting their workers, basically. A lot, of, a lot of graduate students work with the professors, and the professors have to know that they like you, and that they know that you're competent in your research if you want to get a PhD, for example. But other schools, like, uh, law schools or med schools or uh, professional schools, they, they getting, getting a letter of recommendation from your, uh, from your supervisor or from your work, it's not, it's, it's not bad, it's actually encouraged. Uh, I had letters of recommendation from my supervisor uh, in addition to um, my professors. And when I asked my supervisors uh, what they should write about me, I asked them, you know, um, how I grew in it, how I grew in the in the business, how I started off, and where I was where I was at the time that I left the business. Uh, that professional development that you gained, uh, the leadership quality, qualities that you have shown, um, the personal uh, commitments and, and maybe sacrifices you have to make in your work. So, so those are things you can you can talk about, and volunteering at different organizations with issues that you care about. Um, that you advocate about, that also helps as well. Any other questions? Yeah, does the uh, letter should be expired? Yeah. I have, like, for example, if uh, I used to have, actually I still have all the letters from my professor and then my supervisor and my boss. Um, he wrote to the press that he could, but I did not go to the school because there's some other reason that prevent me from going to it. So if I if I want to go back uh, to school, I need new letters, right? I just want to clarify if I want to make assumptions. Don't want to make assumptions. So no, I, I don't think letter uh, recommendation expire at all. Okay. If if you made a, I mean, if if you ask your uh, your the people who write your letter of recommendation, mm -hmm. of course they they think highly of you for 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 doing that. If you make a suggestion, say, hey, I'm applying to grad school again. Um, I'm gonna, I just want to let you know that I'm using the letters that you wrote for me. Um, that's perfectly fine. Okay. But universities don't look for dates. What they look for is the people writing the letters and also who you are and what you did. Um, I, if you kept those 
sir, that's great. I would recommend creating a portfolio for you. Because um, you never know that you'll need these letters again. Um, I mean, once you're in grad school, you might be applying to fellowships, for example. Um, so, or, or scholarships, so these letters come in handy. Because of course, you don't, want, you don't ask the, you know, your professor or supervisor to write three or four different letters. You, ask, you, you give them like a, um, a, a template about what you want them to write, and it's about you, so. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, uh, going back to the, uh, um, to the relevant experience, what they're looking for is your goal. What is it that you want from the university or what is it that you want from graduate school? And when they're thinking about people who, are, who they want to accept, they want to see the person they're going to produce. How active are you going to be in your community, in your field? How active are you going to be or be supportive with the alumni network, for example? What kind of value are you going to add to society? Um, so you want to make sure that you have goals <coughs> um, in your statement of purpose. And you want to show, you know, what, what I mentioned earlier about your work experience. So you want to demonstrate that you're capable of striving to achieve those goals. And so that they can read that, yeah, this person is qualified, he'll study hard, and he'll make something out of it, of himself or herself. Okay? Okay. Now, I think that's as, I think I, I think I, mention uh, what I have to say about getting into grad school. Do you guys have any questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Actually, it's not a question, but this is based on my personal experience. So before we even just um, ask a question whether or not we should go to a graduate school or not, we should ask a question why we should go to graduate school, right? Like a lot of us go to graduate school to make more money. We're just trying to be realistic here. Yeah. But sometimes by going to the graduate school, we don't make more money. You actually lose money going to graduate school. For some, for some people, it's not a good decision. Yeah, if, you think, if you're thinking about making more money, then sometimes it's not a good decision to go to graduate school. Don't you think so? You make a very interesting point. Graduate school is very expensive. Very expensive. Very expensive. Right? Now, you want to make sure that you have the credentials, yes, right? But also, you want to look at scholarships. When I, when I went to go graduate school, um, I had scholarships for Hopkins. Uh, when I went to uh, uh, George Washington, they only gave me a little bit, but I saved enough money from, uh, from working, so that helped, but that, that's something I wanted to do. Um, you definitely have to ask yourself um, money, how important money is, if this is a sustainable program. Um, if you don't get any money, and if you don't get into a, I have to say like a, maybe a, a good school, then maybe there are some schools that are like cash cows where they just take you so they can take for your money. So you definitely want to do your research about if the school is ranked, if the school um, produces uh, um, a lot of candidates who can get jobs. Um, a lot of universities produce uh, surveys, like uh, what kind of jobs <laughs> graduate gets at the end. Look into that. That's definitely a research point that you're gonna have to look into. And making more money, I don't doubt you. Um, because because getting there was a recent report saying that the the degree value of undergraduate is not as high as it once was. The value of undergraduate degree is not worth a lot anymore. And so sometimes you have to be more competitive to get into grad school. Depend on what and it depends on right the here. industry as well. Yeah, I'm speaking generally as a whole, and I can't speak individually for certain fields. Because I have friends who went to law school, mm -hmm. and they went oh, to law yeah, school, yeah. and then they, they have to pay like $500,000. Law schools are hard. <laughs> Sometimes, if you think about law schools, um, and you have no financial assistance, you have no <coughs> scholarships, and the quality of school that you go to, then you might have to reconsider if it's going to actually make something out of it, because a lot of people don't get jobs, because the, mar the market is very saturated. And that's, that's the thing you have to think about. Now, why, why do I talk about grad, graduate school, like um, why it's important to me? You know, I remember um, when I was 19 years old, um, I was an internship for a congressman. 
and there was I went to this fundraiser, and all these people with their nice suits and nice dresses. I was this 19 year old kid with a with a suit that I borrowed from my father. It was oversized. The sleeves went down to my hand and the legs went hand. And I just stood there in the corner. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I didn't talk to anybody. But there was this guy. There was this guy who came up to me and said, what are you doing? And you know, I kind of made some kind of excuse saying, oh, you know, I'm just admiring the food. I'm, I'm admiring the atmosphere. I didn't know how to talk to people. I didn't know how to uh, throw myself out there. I, um, but this guy um, uh, was a professor. And he uh, helped me network with other people. He introduced me, hey, this is Paul. This is Paul. Uh, he's a student. He's working with uh, Congressman Ben Chandler. And then um, I would be able to talk with them. Th that guy, when I think about people who've gone to graduate school, I think about guys who have a lot of experience, a lot of specialties, and they offer a sense of mentorship with to other people. Um, when, I, when I talk about the topic of advancing the Vietnamese American community, what I'm essentially talking about is people with a lot of good credentials, a lot of good background. It doesn't have to be school, it's work experience, uh, graduate schools, sharing that knowledge, sharing that knowledge. And if that knowledge was even more specialized into certain fields, helping younger people get into that field because that knowledge is more specialized, I think that's very important. Um, you know, I have a lot of Chinese friends and they have all these like <coughs> mentors in like top 500 co uh, fortune companies. They, they, they go to these mentoring networks and they <coughs> talk to these people all the time. Like, how do, they, how do I break into the field, um, for example? Having that special credential and that work experience, <coughs> I think it helps yourself, but it also helps the community as well. If, if, if a young person wanted to go into a field that, that you're in, you have that knowledge, you have that expertise to share that. So, any other questions? Any comments? It doesn't have to be a question. It's thoughts. Why do you think that Vietnamese are at the very bottom of all the Asian countries, like speaking Asian, and when at the bottom, or towards the bottom, rather, like food culture? Well, there's a thing as cultural capital. I think when you look at like Americans in general, the, the higher, well, it doesn't have to be Asian. Let's look at you know uh, Americans in a general sense. People with higher income, people with higher education. They can, they, they can talk about the process with their kids. They can talk about their, the way to do things. Um, um, as far as um, Vietnamese Americans, I think uh, a lot of this is because there's a language um, deficiency between the first generation and second generation. A lot of um, uh, adults don't generally understand what Vietnamese Americans go through, and we kind of strive to do it ourselves. Um, but but why, if they're at the bottom, it's not because they don't work hard or they're just not smart enough. It's just because we're a young immigrant group and that, that, that knowledge hasn't been built up yet uh, and passed down a lot yet. Okay. Also, we got to think of this. Americans, uh, a lot of times, if you're next lawyer, your mom's a doctor, it's more likely you're going to be uh, somewhere there. Why? Because they know somebody that's been teaching in school or they know somebody. But you know, when you come over here and your parents work hard to give you that education, you might not have the same opportunities because oh, they weren't doctors or lawyers. You know, they, they might do nails. They might make more than a doctor. But they're not in that circle. You know, when, you, when, you're, when, you're, when you're in the business world, it's basically who you know a lot of times. You know, and the fact that, you know, what did your parents do? If they do nails and you want to get a master's, it's going to be harder than that, that, that uh, you know, that uh, American kid that his dad is a lawyer. You see what I mean? So I, I think, you know, a lot of that has to do with, you know, why we haven't progressed the way we have. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Have you guys ever heard of the bamboo soap? You know, there's like the glass ceiling for women. It's hard for women to rise up in management. But it's even harder for, for Asians in general to ri rise up in management. Like, I think uh, only 0.3% of Asian Americans are in some kind of management position in top 500 fortune companies. Um, it's because, you know, there's some stereotypes that, um, that we're studious, um, we don't have leadership potentials, we don't communicate, 
but it's also because going back to what Bao said, they were taught very young how to network, you know, how to how to meet other people, how to present themselves, how to promote themselves. If you also have to look at this way too, a lot of Americans are very envy of Asian people. The stereotype of Asian people is that we're smart, we work hard, and believe it or not, in a working environment, if I go into a, 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 a office or something where they see I work hard, they're not going to give me a promotion. Even if I'm applying for a job, so somebody that's higher than me will interview me. They know I have the qualification and they know I'm Asian. They, they're afraid that I might take over their job. That is, uh, that is something that does happen a lot in, in the business industry, in corporations. There's, there's a sense that um, assertive Asian is, is kind of a kind of anomaly. It's not very, not a lot of people are used to that. And it's, 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 it's very foreign to a lot of people. And you know, the, in the business world, I'll tell you what, it's about who you know a lot of times. So it's not just credentials. You know, credentials, are because if you don't have the credentials, you won't apply for the job. You know, but sometimes, you know, being Asian, that sometimes works against us. Because they know we work hard, they know we're smart, and sometimes the person that uh, uh, is interviewing you might not give you a job for that. Because I know a lot of people that deserve the jobs, but they're overqualified. You know, have you ever heard of you know, being overqualified? Basically, you're more than qualified for the job, but they won't hire you because you're afraid. They're afraid they hire you, you're going to take over their bench desk. A lot of that does happen. I think, I think preparation is the biggest obstacle. I think when you have a lot of, um, like we mentioned before, uh, uh, Vietnamese Americans, mostly a refu very young, mostly refugee community. Um, and so when we do the comparison with other Asian groups, these days a lot of even those immigrants, m most are established already, but even immigrants from Korea and India, they, they're not refugees when they come over. They're already middle class or upper middle class. So when they come over here, They've already got, um, they've already made it in their home country, and so they're coming here. Um, also, we talked about Vietnamese parents who work long hours in the nail salon and you know restaurants, etc. Um, so they don't have time and time also also on occasion money to or prepare knowledge. or knowledge to prepare their children to put them through Kaplan or you know Princeton Review or SAT prep courses or you know give them the extra have provide the extra lessons for uh, private lessons for or tutoring or anything for you know whether it's classes or you know musical instrument or you know athletics right um, and then because of that you already start at a disadvantage to other middle class upper middle class um, you know families throughout America who can you know provide them these prep courses and obviously SAT scores matter a lot when you get into school and then GREs and GMAT, et cetera. And then there's also the, um, when you talked about glass ceiling um, and bamboo ceiling, um, people say this a lot with women too, in that they're not, as far as management, they're not as assertive in, in the workplace. They don't sell themselves very well. They're not very um, you know, public speaking and getting out there. When you network and try to rise, you have to promote yourself and be able to sell you know, yourself and your credentials and what you are, and a lot of culturally, with uh, at least with Vietnamese Americans and Asian Americans in general, is that we tend not to be, um, because of the way that the home culture was, we tend not to be as assertive and self-promotional and as, um, so I think together those three things are the biggest barriers because we don't, um, in this society, to move up the ladder, we have to be able to be assertive We do for some people, but it's not as deep as other communities to be able to say, you know, so and so works at um, AT and T or works at um, Boeing and can help, you know, tell me how to get into Boeing and to work for them or something. But uh, those are my thoughts. That's, that's how I feel. Is what I'm seeing. Yeah, um, yeah. I think those are the biggest ones. Um, I mean, uh, what you're saying is absolutely relevant too, but I think it's also with everybody, it's relevant for everybody, not just with Vietnamese Americans. Um, but I think with Vietnamese, those are the biggest because, um, you know. But I think with time, it'll get better. You know, we're here, we know better, and then when we have children, you know, they'll know better. And then, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is a, a vitamin C à, cho tiền cho bạn còn hơn để bạn bị buồn đấy in concept you don't need people you don't like people like us đây là why we go back to the team like that, that's that's a problem with there's no unity yeah. uh, like in other words like realistically right let's say I, if I know someone in the same industry as me I'm not helping them but if someone is like Korean Chinese they actually work together for me so that's what happened the mentality that yeah, that's a good point. does not like to help each other they're very good as entrepreneurs you see a lot of successful people very top one 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 but you never see a big group Vietnamese successful. So we're the next generation, so let's make yeah. that happen. Now, there hasn't been any studies shown of Vietnamese-Americans collaboration, but there's lots of studies on Vietnamese collaboration in Vietnam. The World Bank did this interesting study about employers and employees, and one of the biggest problems they have is getting people to collaborate. This is just in Vietnam. Not, I'm, ta I'm not talking about Vietnamese-Americans. I'm talking about in Vietnam. Um, there's not a lot of practices of collaborations. So maybe... It's I don't know, maybe it's because... So you have to understand, we come from a country that's uh, right now is communism. Yeah. So we don't trust the government. We don't, we don't trust anybody because as far as they know, they could work for the government. There's a high level of mistrust. So that's why, you know, we come over here, we, you know, and, you know, a lot of people come from uh, 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 poverty, not because they're poor, but because the government take everything they have. Okay, so we come over here for a new life, but the mentality of where we come from and, you know, what we have to do is to survive. Right. Now, our survival instinct is a little different than if we were raised here in the United States. So that kind of trickled down, but you know, I'm sure the next generation will be a little bit different. It's a, it's a very fight or fight response. It's a very fight or fight response that our, our, our parents have, have lived through because just because they have to survive. Um, sometimes I hear parents talking about, you guys are so, so, uh, so well off, you're so, you don't know how to fight for things anymore, <laughs> like we do. You know, you guys want to collaborate, work together, but that takes too much time. See, like Just this, do things. This is a collaboration right here. Yeah. I mean, this is the next generation. Maybe it's, you guys it's are just some generation. time to, you know, kind of move towards that direction, like the Americans are collaborate. You know, because I'm sure, Nick, when you have kids, you're going to send to the best schools, you're going to have them prepared, and they're going to be, you know, lawyers or doctors. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you guys are thinking like that once you have kids. So, you know, maybe sooner or later, we'll trickle down to that. Yeah, I, I can tell my kids that those are pot uh, barbecue potato chips you're eating. You know. <laughs> That's a very good point, yeah. So the mix that you do with them is very obvious. Like, I, don't, I don't think it's, when you compare all like Asian American, you definitely get a really good point. Yeah, the reason why Indians are at the top is because the, the quotas on what type of people are allowed to come in. So yeah, there's definitely that as a, a point to look at when you're looking you at data like that. Look at the population, the Indian and Chinese compared to Vietnamese, it's like a, a vast majority. I mean, like, you know, the population is much more than us. You know what I mean? So those numbers might add up, but if you do the ratio, yeah, it, it might not be as much as us. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think the number is ratio. It's not the total number, right? It's the ratio, it's right? Percentage. Percentage. It's, percentage. it's percentage, yes. It's yeah, it's but it's not total. It's not total, right? total numbers. I didn't mention you know, right. just the percentage. Yeah, there is a, there's a mix between... It, it, it was a survey conducted by, you know, a random sample of three weeks. Don't you think it's an excuse that we are making right now? Just to be like, oh, because of this and that, and you know, because we are second generation, our parents, this and that. Why don't we try harder and you know, study harder? I'm just giving now an example, right? Japanese American, they're very, very quiet. When I work with them, I work a lot with professors and engineers. They don't talk, you know, but they concentrate on what are they doing. They stay very detail oriented. And if they don't sh share information with you. A lot of things that you are <laughs> telling me that I should do, right? But they are so successful. Maybe their culture has something good that we have to look into. I mean, American culture is good, but not everything is good. 
sometimes those are things that we have to look into that instead of making excuses. Well, ask that to the rest of the group. You know, a lot of people measure success differently. What do you guys think? Now, the thing is, I know that in Japan, education is really important to them. That's why, like, high school, we start our time and get into colleges. Is they, they make it into such an event. And I, there was an article out that there was a big depression and suicide rate among Japanese for those who couldn't get into college because it was so competitive. So I think that, you know, kind of where, you know, the disconnect is, they value education so much as, you know, we kind of had a, you know, war-torn country and that wasn't quite on our radar. So I think that's, that's a bit, education part is part of the culture that we're missing out. In, in Japanese culture, um, their the life is actually defined by the results of their test when they get in middle school. So, they, what what test you uh, what test score you um, get at the end of middle school will determine what kind of high school you go to, and that determines what kind of lifestyle you uh, life you build into. So it's a really big push for little kids to write a lot of stress to learn a lot, um, just so that they can do well in life. But they have to do it very early, and that's that's a lot of stress. And so that comes back to what Nick says: preparation. They were prepared when they were younger, so mm -hmm. that they have that mentality from you know baby up. That's why now that's all they know. That's why they're more focused. That's why they do what they do. Well, I have a question for you. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't know. <coughs> what are the percentages, or maybe you can guess, or maybe you can tell me that most of the grad uh, undergrad students or graduates from college are actually working at career sites. Any statistics? I don't have any statistics on that. That's mm -hmm. something we'll have to look up. I mean, I thought, in my opinion. Like, like, they're, like they study one thing in college and the job they actually get as right. a result right. of the study? Right. I don't, I don't know. I don't Any, think anyone, I have any data with that. The average American takes their career seven times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's better. why the average of us who think, like, I went to college, I didn't do anything in my career today that has to do with anything. So what is amazing to me is when I when I talk to my son, I told him college is your foundation. Why? Because without college, I could have never solved anything I do today, my difficulties in life, what, what I have in my career. Right? Why? Because college has given me that fundamental. Um, college gives you that fundamental of discipline. <coughs> you know the, the, the things that you do in college, you know responsibility. You know the you know making class on time, you know, miss a class, fail a class, and try harder to get into the class that you wanted. So it's all very inclusive. It's a continuance of what you do in actuality, you know, even after college. You still do it today, you know, in, in other lines of work that you guys are doing. That's just my two cents of it. You know, I think there needs a very, uh, you know, focus on economics. We're entrepreneurs, or like you said, okay? I, I know a lot of people that are engineers. Even doctors turn around and do nails. <laughs> Open nail salons. Yeah, I'm serious. I used to have nail salons. I was in that industry. Now I'm in the financial industry. But the fact of the matter is, uh, I'll give, I think our uh, mentality is about making money. Education is one thing, but in the end, if you don't find a job, you got to do whatever it takes, right? So, you know, uh, because that's how the older generation thinks, and sometimes that instilled in some of us later on. Uh, and you know, with the, you know, the way things are right now, education, I, I, like I, I guess he said earlier, I do agree, it is a foundation, but you know, life happens, right? Life does happen, right? Yeah. So this, is there a study where you <coughs> can tell how much more you make comparing to people who already make, bad, uh, who have bachelor degree? Well, is there, like there, there are more studies on field focus, like STEM fields. Generally, they make the most money because they're, mm -hmm. they're the most in demand. But for like liberal arts degree, uh, t generally they tend to be lower. How about engineer, like people yeah. who yeah. have a master degree better. comparing to people who have bachelor? Is it like a lot of money or is it just a little yeah. bit of, is it? Well, it depends yeah. also starting salary. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a lot of yeah, that, start, that start high and then it like plateaus here and there's others that like start lower but you can have the potential to go like really yeah. kind of higher. Yeah. And 20 years ago, <laughs> um, when I graduate, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a big deal because if you
you don't have a BS degree and you apply for the government job, you will get a GS 11 or 9. If you have a BS degree, you get a GS 12. If you have a master's degree, you get a GS 13, 14. And if you have a PhD, you will get a GS 15. That is the requirement. So in order to be a supervisor, you have to have a master's degree. And that is the standard for you know, the government standard. But then nowadays, I've seen GS 15 with no GS degree. But in the IT field, I don't know about the other field. For example, if you're doing like fiber optic research and things like that, a GS 14 is a PhD. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so it, it depends. But then the need of having a master's degree and things like that is not as much as it used to be. <laughs> yeah, what I do know is that high school degrees don't matter anymore. And undergraduate degrees matters a little bit less. And it's and the market has been more competitive and definitely they look to people with a lot more in their background in the general sense. I think also when you look at for our immigrant community, we were talking about making money and survival is the first you know, uh, goal. And so that's why making money is so important for all personal reasons, the enemy of being a lawyer. Yeah. And so it goes to show a little bit that be a doctor, be a lawyer, be an engineer, do something that can make you some money, good fun, salary, and income. Um, and then as um, you know, second generation, third generation, people are a lot more comfortable. Um, and this is what's happened here in America too, is the, the measure of success is no longer about, you know, goal, the end goal is no longer about making money. A lot of times it becomes, as you're more comfortable with you know, choosing what you want to do as your dream, as your passion, as your skill. And so it, it also, I mean, that, that plays a factor too, as far as where communities go and where, um, you know, occupations and educations and where you're at. And so I mean, you see it with every community that first came here with survival and then as it goes on, then the, the careers and the, um, where the communities are. But, you know, you're right. You know, you don't, you can't just, you know, say that, oh, because it's where you are, it's where you are. It's, you kind of have to, at the same time, you know, use your, these skills to find a way of just um, collaborating if possible. And then um, there's, there are some communities that come and don't, you know, it's a difference between how fast you grow and how fast you um, prosper. Not every community, you know, gets here and then explodes. You know, I want I want my kids to join the choir or be in the start of the school play, or be a captain of the football team, and if they ever choose the arts, if they ever have the luxuries as that, you know, <coughs> and and not like be my parents and push it into like you got to join the math club and computer <coughs> club, for example. But you know, when we think about like psychological needs, once people reach like a certain level of comfort, they're going to expand on their luxury, and and as a community, I, I think. Um, we have developed a lot of that, that cultural no knowledge that we can help pass them down to, to our kids so that their lives don't have to be focused on survival but on other things um, but on their own uh, leisure or their own fulfillment, if that makes sense. Uh, so any other questions or comments? I have one comment that when we think about our Vietnamese American also another group of people like our uncle or our cousin, they are immigrated to the, the state through our parents. That those group of people that are attached to us regarding our you know salary or education. I I have a lot of group or meet a lot of people they are immigrate to here through their relatives or family member and they have to start at the beginning. They threw everything in Vietnam and they come here because of their children. And once again, when they come here, they have to work in nail salon, restaurant, mm -hmm. to help their children to go to school. And those kids, because of education system over there, when they come here, they have to learn again. And they have to follow the law, how to get the driver license. It's not look like in Vietnam, okay, you go there with 200 bucks and then you get the driver license right away. <laughs> here, you have to take the, you know, test and everything. 
So that cultural gap and education system also affect to them, and they also in the group of Vietnamese American. Yeah. yeah so if we, if we can do, I think from now on, we can try to you know help those people like that are among us about communication skill, leadership skill. Anybody that's a speaker on that certain topic that you know would be able to benefit, please communicate yes. that with we us. We actually have feedback forms for you guys so you can kind of fill those out. So we definitely want to, again, be based. And I, there's certain things I've always.